the old magician took off his cape slowly. He had earned it, his the ancient green cape bestowed on him in gratitude for his life's work. There was a scroll as well, inscribed with red, real gold leaf, for distinguished service to hum humankind. It hadn't been easy serving to humankind in the latest 20th and early 21st centuries. The problems in every corner of the world had been endless and at times seemingly insurmountable, but the hardest part of his job was that very few people believed in magic anymore, which meant that he and his colleagues could not perform the sweeping dramatic acts that had made magicians, witches, wizards, mages, seers, and shamans renowned and revered all over the millennium of human existence. These days they would be laughed at as charlatans or crackpots or worse. Instead they had to work in secret and with stealth. Good timing, coincidence, serendipity, the tools of the modern magician's trade. The rain that doused the spark before it became a forest fire, a better than average harvest. A long lost friend found via internet search for com kumquats. There have been times when he longed to put together something more, a bit more dramatic, but he stifled that desire for the greater good. Now he will retire for a well-earned rest, perhaps just a little magic closer to home. Emma and Francis were taking one of their bicker walks in the woods, not far from their home. They went for bicker walks regularly, several times a week, in fact. The sisters bickered constantly. The full range from snide twits to wide open, full, full throttle arguments, especially in the summer when they were home for, together for long hours. Whenever one parent or the other got tired of hearing them, they were told, Take yourselves out and you're bickering out of this house this instant. Today, by the time the girls had reached the path in the woods, They had completely forgotten the cause of this particular walk, having embarked on a new bicker. I get the first one. Why should you get it? I just want it just as much as you do. I want it more. No, I want it more. How do you know how much I want it? You think you know everything. They were arguing about who got to pick the first blackberry, but it was only June, too early for blackberries, which meant they were bickering over something that didn't even exist yet. Emma was almost 12 and would be in 6th grade in the fall, but before this particular walk, she would have said that she didn't believe in magic. Frances, two years younger, would have said she wasn't sure. One minute they were ambling toward a stand of brambles, and the next they were in a cave. A man stood before them with a harp at his side. Emma blinked several times. This can't be happening, she thought, and then, what a cliched thing to think, but anyway, it must be a dream, I will go with it for now. Except for his sudden presence, there was nothing terribly frightening about the man. He was rather ordinary looking, medium height, with a tan complexion, gray hair, and dark eyes. The only thing about him being his cape. Unusual thing about him being his cape. It had some fraying around the edges, but it was a cheerful green hue between lime and emerald. Emma thought a black cape might have been scarier. Scary was the effect he was going for. It took him only moments to cast a spell, which he did by whirling the cape around his body and over his head several times. Francis made a noise of admiration, and Emma had sensed her sister was longing to keep, try cape whirling herself. Then the magician handed Emma a scroll and vanished, having not said a word. Emma immediately began reading aloud from the parchment. The spell will be broken when Francis learns to play the harp well enough to satisfy the conditions set by the writer of William Congreve, who wrote, Music hath charms to soothe a savage breast, to soften rocks or bend a knotted oak. You are permitted to leave the cave as necessary, but do not attempt to leave the woods. You are in a bubble of time. Your family will not miss you. Time will pass much slower for them than for you. Emma, 
It was Francis's voice, but it came out of the, from, from the ground near Emma's feet. Emma looked down and let out a screech of horror. Francis had been turned to a frog. Emma screeched a few more times and hyperventilated. Francis hopped madly around the cave. After this reasonable interval of panic, the sisters... If your sister has been turned to a frog, you still, she's still your sister, isn't she? Decided together that neither of them was dreaming. They calmed down, doing their best to think brave thoughts. Emma. I have to figure this out and take care of Francis. Francis. I've always been the adventurous one. I have to keep my head here or else Emma will really freak out. The first plan was to try to leave the woods. Emma carrying Francis in the palm of her hand. She smacked right in the middle into an invisible barrier like a force field in science fiction movies. After some exploration, they determined that a barrier had a rough circumference of perhaps a hundred yards with a stream marking part of it. Which Francis discovered by jumping in by, from one bank and trying to jump out on the other side. Wham! Into the force field, splashed back into the stream. Escape thus st stymied. The sisters tried to turn to the others in terms of the spell. Emma was in her second year of violin lessons, but a violin was very different from a harp. She'd never even seen a harp up close. Still, she knew more about music than Francis did. Francis had never played a musical instrument. She just finished third grade and was not beginning music lessons so forth. Besides which, she was now a frog. No, I won't go. You can't make me. Brian slammed his bedroom door and then kicked it a few times. What he said wasn't true. Dad could indeed make him stay with Gramps for the summer. Mom would have at least listened. She'd done her best to treat him like a sixth grader, not a baby. But she probably would have sided with Dad in the end, and then Brian would have been mad at both of them. No, that didn't make any sense either. If Mom were still alive, she was, there still wouldn't be any talk about Gramps living with Brian all summer. Gramps had brought up the idea at Mom's funeral in February. It'll do you good. How can living in the middle of nowhere do me any good? Right there in the funeral home. Everyone stared and turned away uneasily. Brian stormed out of the building. Unable to think of what else to do, he sat in the car and missed the whole surface. Missed his chance to say a last goodbye to Mom. A whole summer where he didn't know anyone, miles away from anything to do. It was typical of his life, way of life he, his life was going these days. He had gotten in trouble at school several times for cutting classes. He quit playing soccer right before he would have gotten off the team for yelling at everyone. The refs and the opponents and the teammates too. He had driven away everyone, his, his friends one by one with his anger and outbursts and overall surliness. And Dad thought Brian spent too much time on the computer or playing video games, stabbing his neck and had him get outside, ride his plate, do something. Gramps didn't have a computer or a game system. He didn't even have a television. Radio and good books, Gramps always said. Don't need more than that. This is going to be the worst summer of Brian's life. Gramps himself was okay as grown-ups went, but Brian didn't even really know him all that well. He didn't talk much, neither did Brian, which seemed to see both of them. And things began to look up a little the day after Dad's... Brian's dad left to go back to the city. Ah, I thought we'd go to the animal shelter, Gramps said at the breakfast table. I mean to get a dog. Now's as good a time as any. Brian sat up straight for the first time in months. He always wanted a dog. But pets weren't allowed in the apartment where he and Dad lived. You'll have to stay a bit here when you go back, Gramps said. Of course, no good news without Dad to go with it. 
There are 15 dogs in the shelter. All of them are sort of something. Sort, sort of spaniel, some sort of retriever, some sort of terrier. Each dog knows that the bars of his cage and wagged his tail when Brian approached. How was he ever to choose? Three times he went around the crates and no, was no closer to decision than when he began. At one point, Brian looked up to see every single dog staring at him and he could have sworn all of them had hopes in their eyes. Mike felt confusion first, followed by the familiar warmth of anger stirring inside him. I thought this would be fun, but I don't know what to do. I can't pick one over another. I hate this. This is stupid, he said to Gramps. It's going to be your dog. You should choose. Gramps stared, gazed at him steadily. I don't care. You pick. Brian turned away, glaring at the floor. He hated when people said that. I don't care. It always made him want to shout, care? Why don't you care? It seemed like there were so many things people didn't care about. Like all these dogs. An idea hit him. A really good idea. The dogs, uh, he said to the volunteer, out of all of them, which one is, I mean, is there one who, uh, whose time is almost up? The woman pointed without hesitation. That one, she said. He's been here for almost a month. The tan and gray dog. White face, pointed ears, and snout. A sort of husky. He came in off the streets. No tags, the woman said. That means you get to name whatever you want. She opened the cage and the dog tried to rot the, try to right to Brian. He knelt down and scratched behind the ears. Hey there, Brian said softly. You want to come home with us? The dog went a little and wagged his tail. He looked at Brian as if trying to tell him something. Douglas, Brian said. The name popped out into his head out of the blue. He looked up at Gramps and it would be Gramps' dog after Brian left. Is that okay? Douglas, Gramps said slowly as if we're tasting the name. Then a little louder. Douglas? The dog turned his head in to look at Gramps. He already knows his name, the volunteer said with a grin. You can call him Dougie for short, maybe. Brian wanted to point out that Dougie had hardly any shorter than Douglas, but decided not to. She was only trying to be nice. And not five minutes after they got back to Grant's place, it turned out that Dougie was a pretty good name after all, because the dog marked the holy yard. He started to dig. He dug and dug and dug. Dougie. On the very first day of heart practice, Francis pointed out the obvious. I can't play the normal way, she said. My arms are, my front legs aren't long enough to get strings for both sides. She plucked at the bottom one string, which gave out a dismal twang, then hopped up on the frame and stretched out for the higher strings. This is impossible, she complained. I can't even reach all of them. After some discussion, the sisters decided that nothing in the rules barred Emma from helping Francis. After all, it was Emma who had carried the arb out of the cave and placed it on a flat rock next to the stream so Francis could have easy access to the water when she wanted a quick tip or a drink. Gotta stay hydrated, Francis said, ex exercising her newly acquired frog instincts. And of course, Emma needed to teach Francis the basics of music. Now she picked up Francis and stood next to the harp. Look, Emma said, I can hold out my hands like this. She spread them out about eight inches apart, and you could hop from one to the other. I can move them put you wherever you want to be. The strategy enabled Francis to reach all the strings. The next task was to figure out how she could elicit a true note from the harp. It required delicate maneuvering for Francis to pluck a string with a webbed toe. She also found it difficult to keep her throat from puffing out. When her throat touched a vibrating string, not only did the sound die, but her whole head twanged and twizzled. Put me down. Francis said at the end of the first day. 
She's flopped down on the ground, exhausted. Never been so tired in all my whole life. Will you catch me some flies, please? The blue green ones are the nicest. Yuck, Emma said. Catch your own flies. Cube noisy bickering, which lasted until Francis splashed off in the huff. After a week, Francis could pluck out a recognizable rendition of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Emma was so sick of hearing it that she had to remind herself not to clench her fists. Francis might not be able to land easily on a fist and fall. Might fall, in the worst case bad timing scenario. Emma could end up with a handful of squashed frog sister, so she gritted her teeth instead. But it doesn't sound like a harp, Francis said. It just sounds like plucking. Harp music, it should have parts where, uh, you know, you play a whole bunch of strings fast, so it sounds like a, a waterfall or something. Glissando, Emma said. You're right. For the next several days, the sisters developed and practiced the glissando technique. It involved Francis extending one toe to rake over the strings while Emma moved the, her hand back and forth. Glissandos were hard on poor Frances. Her whole body juddered, bone shaking me all the time. She developed blisters on her toes, and the webs of her feet got all stretched out. It's all right for you, Frances grumbled. You're not a frog. Emma had no answer to that. Dougie's enthusiasm for digging seemed boundless, but he wouldn't just dig around anywhere. He would trot around, sniff here and there, paw at the ground a little, and often reject a spot. Following my, by more trotting and sniffing, he left behind a landscape of compromising holes of various sizes, mounds of grass and leaves mixed with the soil, and patches of plowed up earth. Gramps' yard, both front and back, looked like the site of a major archaeological dig. A few days after Dougie came to live with them, Gramps got fed up. I don't want him digging up the yard anymore, he said. Take that dog into the woods, let him dig there. Brian scowled and pressed his lips together. It felt like Gramps was kicking Dougie out of the yard, just like Dad kicked Brian out of the apartment. Gramps gave Brian a quick look as if he knew what Brian was thinking. While you're out there, you might try listening for the music. What music? Woods music, Graham said. Brian stared in surprise. That was weird, coming from Graham's too. Too, uh, poetic or something. Graham had already taken Brian on a couple of walks through the woods. He showed Brian where the main paths were and how the stream would lead to the road if he ever got lost. Gramps seemed to know everything about the woods, but as usual, he didn't talk much on their walks. Which was fine with Ryan, he wanted to discover the woods for himself. On entering the woods with Dougie, Brian had to smile at the dog's response. Dougie was practically beside himself with joy, sniffing madly at everything and bounding through the trees ahead of Brian. Coming back to the side, bounding away again. Brian lost sight of Dougie for a few moments, then caught up with him at a big oak tree. The tree had apparently passed the Dougie sniff test because the dog was, was now digging happily at its base. He paused and barked a few times. What is it, Dougie boy? Brian squatted down and but Dougie barked again, looking up at the broad the tree's broad branches. Brian frowned. There's something up there. You want me to go see? The old oak was the rarest of specimens. A perfect climbing tree. In just a few moments, Brian was up amid the branches, seeing the woods out from the whole up new angle. The lower limbs were broad enough to sit on comfortably, and Brian immediately began making plans. I could bring lunch and a book. Dougie dug contentedly at the base of the tree where Brian made his plants and branches. 
Maybe even build a tree house or at least some kind of platform. A basket with a rope so I could haul Dougie up. As Brian was getting ready to climb back down, he froze and lifted his head like a deer on alert. What's that? Music? Brian frowned, listening hard. Perhaps he'd imagined it, or it could have been something else. Like a bird.